Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very glad and honored to chair the final session of this meeting, uh, which is devoted to Machiavelli and the Aristotelian uh, heritage. And uh, I'm also delighted to introduce you uh, our first speaker for this session, Professor Manuel Knoll. Uh, who he earned a PhD in philosophy, political science and history from the University of Munich in 2000. In 2020, uh, Professor Knoll became professor of political theory and philosophy at the Turkish German University in Istanbul, and this is the third full professorship award of his career. And in 2013, he has become a member of the Instituto Lucio Anneo Seneca here in Madrid. Uh, his main research and lecturing interests are in ancient, modern and contemporary political philosophy and ethics, in particular ancient and contemporary theories of justice, deep disagreements on justice, values and morals, but also Plato, Aristotle and Machiavelli. He's also the author of many important publications on Aristotle, but not only on Aristotle, also on uh, Theodore Adorno. Uh, he's also published uh, a book on Nietzsche, Nietzsche as political philosopher, and also a book uh, entitled Antique Griechische Philosophie. Uh, today, he's going to talk about uh, uh, the indebtedness of Machiavelli's method and conception of political science to Aristotle's politics. So, Manuel, the floor is yours. Thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you so much for the organizers for this wonderful conference. Yes, the indebtedness of Machiavelli's method and conception of political science and Aristotle's politics. So at first glance, we could say this is an incongruent couple. These two guys don't really go together, but my experience is that we can understand Aristotle better through the lens of Machiavelli and Machiavelli better through the lens of Aristotle. So that's what I'm trying to, to show you today. But first, uh, is it really a topic? Um, I'm saying here on the, I'm reading some of these slides. Um, as a political philosopher, Aristotle is primarily known for his po normative political thought connected to his virtue ethics and theory of human flourishing. As a political theorist, Machiavelli is primarily known for Il Principe, which teaches a new prince lessons on new principalities, in particular, come questi principati si possino governare e mantenere. So that looks quite <laughs> different topics. Machiavelli is known and often defended against his critics as a political realist. That's the most famous quotation about Machiavelli's political realism. He says, ma sendo intenzione mia stata scrivere cosa che sia utile e chi la intende, mi è parso più conveniente andare dritto alla verità effettuale della cosa che alle immaginazioni di essa. E molti si sono immaginati repubbliche e principati che non si sono mai visti né conosciuto in vero essere. So he says, I want to look at how things really are. I'm not dreaming of, of utopians. I'm, I'm not making any um, outlines of utopian um, states or constitutions. And, and that seems very much directed um, against Aristotle, politics seven and eight, uh, the, 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 the polis, the, c the constitution according to our prayers, according to, to our wishes. So, so that seems to be Machiavelli's realism, seems to be a clear criticism, of course, of Plato and many others, but also so of Aristotle. Um, and there is another idea why this might not, why these two authors might not be a good couple. The last uh, bullet point here on the, on the slide, while well, Aristotle wrote at least one ethical treatises and likely two or even three, there's so much new literature on the Eudemian ethics and now everyone seems to say that's clearly uh, Aristotelian, Helmut Flascher still uh, doubts it. Um, on the other hand, Machiavelli is often accused to be a Machiavellista a defender of an immoral politics focused merely on interests and power, 
or even as Leo Strauss says, as a teacher of evil. So we have Aristotle who, who, who writes ethical treatises and Machiavelli, the teacher of evil or uh, the, the Machiavellian uh, thinker. Okay, so here are the thesis I'm defending in my talk. Thesis number one, Machiavelli incorporated a lot from Aristotle's politics in his own work, in particular from book five. I think that is uh, mainly from which we talked about it in the discussion after our, our last talk. He clearly um, copied, we would even nowadays say plagiarized a lot um, from chapter 10 and chapter 11 about monarchies. So, and as I said, Dolph Sternberger, he has eight or ten pages where he compares uh, utterances by, by Aristotle and by Machiavelli. This is number two. Uh, Machiavelli takes up A, Aristotle's conception of political science as a practical science, and B, his empirical, inductive, and comparative method. Of course, I will explain uh, these thesis and give you some support for it. Thesis number three, both Aristotle's and Machiavelli's conceptions of political science are based to a large extent on an analysis of human passions, desires, and emotions, which they hold to be the invariant driving forces of political behaviors and actions, ambition, greed, love and hatred, is it better to be feared than love is the title of one of Machiavelli's chapters. Um, you, Silvia uh, Gastaldi talked about uh, book two of, of the rhetorics, but we can find a lot of book two of Aristotle's rhetorics also in book five of his politics, anger, indignation, Nemesan, Orge, so, so that is, uh, plays both a role for, for Machiavelli, an important role to analyze uh, politics, both for Aristotle and Machiavelli. This is 3b. Machiavelli developed a political psychology of motivation, especially of the motivation of political actors, that goes back to a considerable extent to Aristotle's Politics, Book 5, which Machiavelli clearly knew, knew in the translation of Leonardo Bruni, and to Aristotle's Rhetorics, as I just said, uh, Book 2. Okay, the last thesis, I hope we have time for this. I'm looking on my watch, and <laughs> it's already gotten kind of late. <laughs> um, thesis 4a, under normal, um, peaceful conditions, both Aristotle and Machiavelli defend a republican political order and a mixed constitution. Um, the mixed constitution, that is what is called politeia, polity, usually translated into English. This is not the best constitution of book seven and eight of the politics. And just to say a few words about Machiavelli, I think we can clearly say that il principe is not a defense of the political system called principality, uh, because Machiavelli says a principality is not a good political system because the son uh, of the prince, or even the latest the son of the son of the prince, they won't have the qualities uh, of the prince, so they have to, it, it, it moves towards tyranny, which is also kind of uh, stated in Polybios. In the, in the circle of the Constitution, um, where, where he says exactly this, and, and Machiavelli takes this in the Discorsi, book one, chapter two. He has almost a, a literal uh, plagiarism, we would say nowadays, of, of, of Polybius. Um, we had the talk yesterday on, 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 on Polybius. This is for B, um, the sources of Machiavelli's defense of republicanism and uh, sorry, let me say one more thing before I move to uh, thesis number four. B, uh, again, in the Discourses, book one, chapter two, Machiavelli, like Polybius, he says the Roman Republic 
and its mixed constitution, a mix of kingship, aristocracy, and democracy. Like Polybius he says, this constitution is the reason for, for Rome's success. So, and he clearly defends, and he says, era una repubblica perfetta. Uh, so, so he clearly uh, defends um, the, the mixed constitution and, and not the principality as the best political system. Okay, thesis 4b. The sources of Machiavelli's defense of republicanism and a mixed constitution go back further than only to Titus Livius and Polybius. Uh, contemporary neo-republicanism is not only the heir of the Italian Atlantic tradition, as Philip Pettit, he has this important book from 1999 called Republicanism, and partly Poco claim, but also to the Greek tradition of Plato, the laws, the mixed constitution of the laws, which takes Sparta as a model, and also Aristotle, uh, book four, the, the so-called Politeia. Okay, these are the theses. Let's see how much time I, I have to, to defend them. Um, yes, Aristotle's Politics, the book of politics. Um, I will be talked about this long enough, so there is a big controversy among the interpretation of, of the politics. Is it a unified treatise, or does it defend a unified constitutional theory, or is it like a, a set of essays, as Eckhart Schutrumpf claims, published at different stages of Aristotle's life? Are there major um, contradictions between the different books and statements? We don't really have to go into these problems here, because for Machiavelli, uh, what really matters are just the so-called empirical books, four to six, and in particular, book number four. OK, thesis number one. And we talked about this before the lunch break. Um, in all likelihood, Machiavelli read Leonardo Bruni's translations of Aristotle's politics, completed in 1437, so much later uh, than, than the translation we talked about in the two talks before my talk. And as I said, uh, Dolph Sternberger here, are, it's on the web page of the conference, he made a comprehensive comparison of passages from Machiavelli's Prince and book uh, five chapters 10 and 11 of Aristotle's politics, showing how much Machiavelli took up. You know, this book came out in 78. There is a reprint from 84. And here, if you want to look at this, uh, that is very interesting to see how much Machiavelli took from, from book five of the politics. Here is a little more literature on this. Uh, there is also an Italian publication by Luigi Zanzi, I segni della natura e paradigmi della storia, il metodo del Machiavelli. There is Henning Ottmann um, and also Friedrich Memel, Machiavelli und die Antike. Okay, so I think, you know, we don't have to talk too much about thesis number one. As I said, there is so much literature and I just don't want to uh, repeat what has already been, been said in the literature. So far, let's come to Aristotle's practical science, um, which I think is the, the role model or is the, the paradigm for, for Machiavelli's way to, to do uh, political science. You know, he's not uh, part of the Middle Ages anymore. He clearly uh, thinks, yeah, we're doing something new here. We're, we're, we're moving back, we're, we're, we're connecting uh, ourselves to the, to the illumination of the ancient uh, world. Uh, so he has this kind of Renaissance uh, philosopher's uh, consciousness. Okay, um, that's something you, you all know. Um, Aristotle's practical science, uh, in contrast to theoretical knowledge, practical knowledge is not interested in knowledge as an end in itself, but knowledge is a means for praxis. Um, practical science and its knowledge aims at praxis. And I think the same is true for, for, for Machiavelli. He's not interested in, in just studying constitutions, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, we had this quote from, from chapter 15 
of uh, the prince, where he says, Ma sendo l'intenzione mia stata scrivere cosa che sia utile a chi si intende. So he wants to say useful things, he wants to say things the politician, a political leader, can put into practice in his political decisions and actions. So both have, I'm saying here, uh, both Aristotle and Machiavelli have the intention to give valuable advice to politicians. I also think they're both political realists, but they both aim with their practical advices also at a normative goal, political stability. So, so they are analyzing, we will see, like, why did the revolution happen there? Why this democracy lost stability? Why this oligarchy lost stability? But he's analyzing and trying to make inductions from certain historical events with the normative goal to have political stability. And that's exactly what Aristotle does in Book 5. Um, he wants to uh, avoid uh, stasis. He wants to give advice is how to stabilize especially democracies and oligarchies. I think that's why he says the polity is a mix of these two constitutions because these are the most widespread forms of constitution and we can make democracies more oligarchic means we can give the rich more rights to participate and vice versa. Um, in the oligarchies we can include the people more in um, the political participation. And, you know, for Machiavelli, there is this uh, famous term, mantenere lo stato, and it's a disputed issue. What does he mean uh, with lo stato? I think we can, we can prove, uh, and I, I, I did some work with Stefano Saragino together on this, like, like the term uh, ragione di stato, the reason of state, is only mentioned by Botero a bit later, but I think we can clearly show he, that Machiavelli means with mantenere lo stato, he talks like conservare lo stato, and, and I think we can clearly show that stato means not only the, the status, the social status of the prince, but it really already means like the state uh, in the modern understanding of the concept of the state. Okay. Aristotle's empirical, inductive, and comparative method. These three ways I characterize Aristotle's and also Machiavelli's method, they of course go together. Um, as early, I'm reading, as early as at the end of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle announces his research plan for book five of the politics, I think, uh, we can talk a lot about the last phrases of the Nicomachean Ethics, but I think this phrase clearly refers to Book 5 uh, of the Politics, uh, where he says in the translation of Crisp, then in the light of the political systems we have collected, you know, 158 uh, politaiai, in the light of the political systems we have collected, let us try to consider what sorts of things preserve and destroy cities and each type of political system. And I think that, as I said, that clearly refers to Book 5, where Aristotle um, does research on, on, on stasis, on uh, there is this book by Scaltati from, from 2019, where he says stasis in Book 5 means clearly civil war. But you know, we can translate it with uprising. There are so many <laughs> different uh, ways uh, to faction, factional conflict, etc., uh, etc. Et OK, let's talk a bit more about Aristotle before we move on to Machiavelli. As undertaken at a later time by Machiavelli, Aristotle resorts to the historical experience of the last century and gains, based on particular events of constitutional history, general rules, Machiavelli talks about the regole generale, about how political systems originate and why they are stable or instable. So Aristotle really, like Plato, thinks we can learn from history. In Book 5 of the Politics, from which Machiavelli, as I said, drew heavily, 
Aristotle examines the causes and goals of uprisings and revolutions. Among them, there are fear, contempt, anger, indignation, and especially the desire for profit and honor. These are, with Thomas Hobbes, we could say these are anthropological axioms. People want uh, time, they want recognition. People, uh, pleonexia already condemned by Plato, people want to make a profit, want to become rich and richer. Book five can be interpreted as one of the first studies of the political role of emotions, desires, and passions. I will come to that in a minute, but let me just first give you some concrete example on how Aristotle works in book five of the politics. He says about the loss of stability of democracies. Uh, Aristotle, like Machiavelli, he gives a general rule. He says, um, it originates from the insolence of the demagogues who, for example, confiscate the fortune of the rich citizens, which leads them to overthrow democratic political systems. And here comes the inductive part I'm um, saying here on the, on the slide. As historical examples from which he derives this rule, Aristotle mentions the fall of democracy in Kos, Rhodes, Heraclea, Megara, and in Cumis. So he says, look, we, we can see, we can learn from history in all of these uh, cities in all of these constitutions. Um, the demagogues were greedy. Uh, they, they, they wanted to confiscate uh, the wealth of the rich citizens. And as a result, we had stasis. We have an uprising and a constitutional change. So it, he compares it. He makes inductions like from particular events. He derives uh, general rules. So uh, from knowledge of the causes of the overthrow of a political system, uh, one can derive advices for its stabilization. That's the normative uh, political goal which Aristotle pursues in Book 5 of the Politics. So in regard to the mentioned example for the loss of stability of democracies, Aristotle recommends in the section on the preservation of democracies and in democracies, it is necessary to be sparing the wealthy, not only by not causing properties to be divided up, but not incomes either. So if we know the causes of a stasis of political instability, we know how to avoid it from happening. Yes, uh, practical science, scientific explanation means knowledge of the causes. Uh, that is true for, for, for both Aristotle and, and, and Machiavelli. According to Aristotle's understanding of science, to scientifically explain something means to acquire knowledge of its origins and causes. And you know, there is clearly a difference. Aristotle distinguishes between four different causes. And for Machiavelli, understanding the causes He's just interested in the efficient causes, as we say nowadays. He is not really looking at final causes. And you know, for Aristotle, also in Book Five, it's very clear uh, what, why do people start an uprising? One is because they aim at riches and and glory, they think, or at least recognition or honor. They think, for example, in uh, oligarchy, uh, the common people think we are not honored. Uh, enough, so so they get angry, they get they feel outraged, and and that's the motive why they start an uprising. Yes, um, let me move on a bit farther here. We already talked about honor and and profit as as cardos as as main uh, goals. Um, let's move on to emotions and. Uh, desires, because as I said uh, in thesis number three, both uh, Aristotle and Machiavelli um, propose a political psychology of motivation. They say it's like the human passions uh, that motivate 
political actions. Um, and probably you can see here, left uh, is Kerdos, the striving for, for, for gain, and, and the right picture um, is supposed to, to illustrate ambition, human ambition. Okay, let's look at the role of passions and emotions in politics according to Aristotle. For Aristotle and Machiavelli, central invariant causes and motives of human and political actions are passions, drives, and emotions. And also Aristotle is not uh, the first one who, who talks about this. We find this in Thucydides, we find this in Plato, there are similar ideas that the human uh, nature is kind of unchangeable. Humans are always driven by, by, by such passions. Um, okay, um, and here we come, Silvia, we talked about this over lunch. Um, similarly, Machiavelli, okay, now no, let's go here in the second one, about the relation of these goals, Aristotle explains, for the mass of mankind are more covetous of gain than of honor. So people are more moved to make more money than to be recognized. And similarly, Machiavelli explains that men forget the death of a father more quickly than the loss of a patrimony. So kind of like <laughs> uh, the striving for, for, for gain, pleonexia, in the material sense is kind of the main motive of humans and you know that's corruption and everything we talked about uh, so far yes the role and passions of uh, the role of passions and emotions in politics um, for aristotle it is not simply the striving for material gain and honor that is an essential feature of human nature and an important basis for analyzing politics the same is true for an extreme striving for these goals called greed and ambition. Um, and Machiavelli, he has even like um, an allegory on l'ambizione. Um, so we find uh, this a lot uh, in, in Machiavelli, that these are the main passions, the strive for power, etc., etc. Okay, Machiavelli's Aristotelian political science. Learning. Five minutes. Okay. Uh, learning from history. I'm summarizing a little bit. Machiavelli says there is something necessary in history. That's why we can learn from history. And what is necessary that humans always have the same passions and are motivated by, as we said, by ambition by gain, etc. And um, he says here in the Italian text, Io ho sentito dire che la storia è la maestra delle azioni nostri e massime dei principi, e il mondo fu sempre ad un modo abitato da uomini che hanno avuto sempre le medesime passioni. So that uh, could also be said by, by Aristotle, people always had the same um, passions. That's why we can learn, why we can calculate. Uh, we can know how people will act in certain situations because they are driven all by these passions and emotions. So uh, human nature does not change. He has in this famous uh, proemio of the discourse, like the sun, um, like um, the, the, the sky, the sun, the elements, they don't change. And the same is true for Machiavelli about human nature. Machiavelli conceives of man's nature as a multitude of dispositions, desires, passions, desires, and motion. And as I said, greed, um, avarizia, and ambition, ambizione, are the main ones. And there are a couple of more uh, quotes that substantiate this. Machiavelli, compared to Aristotle, of course, he looks back to 2,500 years of history, while Aristotle only looks back to a couple of centuries. And um, about Machiavelli's empirical, inductive, and comparative motive uh, method, Machiavelli distinguishes between a general rule that never fails, uh, a general rule 
that um, almost never fails and also they're also he's aware that there are some cases where you cannot derive any empirical uh, uh, conclusions. Many headlines, and that's probably interesting for those who, who read Machiavelli, many headlines of the chapters of the discourse in Machiavelli's principal work are general rules. For example, quanto siano in una repubblica necessarie le accuse a mantenerla in libertade. So how important accuses the legal system is to keep republics free. La moltitudine è più savia e più costante che un principe. So the multitude is wiser and more stable <laughs> than the prince. And one, and Machiavelli talks a lot about necessità, come egli è necessario a volere mantenere una libertà acquistata di nuovo, ammazzare i figlioli di brutto. So if you establish a new republic, you have to kill all the people <laughs> who had a profit from the previous political system. I, my watch says I did exactly yeah. 30 minutes. I have three more slides, but uh, probably uh, we can talk about this uh, in the discussion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Knoll, for this very interesting paper. Um, if you agree, I would like to ask Professor Lisi to join us and give his paper, and then we can have a shared discussion. But only if you if you agree, would it be okay for you? Yeah, I'm not a big fan uh, of this because people forget maybe what I've said after his talk. But if you think I we need, prefer. do we are we in time pressure? If we're in time pressure, yes, yes, of course. If you prefer, prefer if the discussion now, no problem. Okay. Okay, then so we can have a discussion right now. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. <laughs> so the floor is open for questions. I remember in the talk of uh, Professor Hatzis, uh, Hatzis Tavro when you were speaking about the multitude, because uh, this, this fragment of the multitude is quite uh, exactly almost the, the, the similar words in Machiavelli discourse and in, in Aristotle about the fact that the multitude sometimes is wiser when uh, not for performing political role themselves but for choosing people because they choose usually someone who has a certain certain virtue yeah yeah politics yeah. book three chapter 11. but uh, the r I, I see that there is a, a difference between Machiavelli and uh, and Aristotle, in my opinion, I don't know if I your reading is also the same. I see that in Machiavelli there is even a psychological, the psychological analysis is even wider uh, because he's given a reason that you don't find in Aristotle is to say, well, this is so because the passions of the multitude, they are not so dangerous for the Republic as the ones of the uh, oligarchs, the, the uh, the, the aristocrats or the um, or the king who is driven by greed, by ambition, and the multitude is want to be free or not to be a uh, slave of, of someone. Do you agree that there is uh, perhaps uh, in Machiavelli even a, a deeply psychological analysis of, of the political facts? Yeah, thank you for uh, this question. I think there is a lot uh, to say uh, as an answer. I, I think one, uh, Machiavelli says, you know, he's clearly uh, favoring a mixed constitution, which means in modern terms, a division of power, you have checks and balances, um, and of course, uh, that keeps also the different passions in check, you know, the aristocrats, they, they strive for, for glory, uh, the masses, more or less, they don't want to be uh, subjected uh, by, by, by certain rulers. So I think clearly this idea why Machiavelli favors the, the, the multitude um, is that he says he wants a, a constitution in which the multitude participates, a mixed uh, constitution. So if you have like an oligarchy, just a few rulers or a, a principality, uh, you have, let's say, the son of the of the prince who doesn't have the passions and he uh, not not sorry, doesn't have the prudence uh, and the virtue of, of his father, and and then he will act 
like a tyrant. I don't think that there is such a thing what we call the summation theory, you know, like the different people make different judges of a, let's say, of a piece of art, of an artwork. I don't think we have, we have this uh, in, in Machiavelli, but I think uh, especially in the Discourses, Book 1, Chapter 9, he says there needs to be one person to create a, a new political order, and I think that also explains us the relation between the prince and the discourses, like in a state of anarchy, uh, again, the, the lowest state of, of Polybius uh, circle of the constitutions, to create a new order in times of anarchy, which is Ita I Machiavelli's contemporary Italy, you need one person. Uh, but in order to, to keep this new order stable, this person has to kind of give up power <laughs> uh, before he dies. And, and, and make, um, allow a mixed constitution, a, a republic to happen. Is that like a, a, a sci is there a psychological theory? But yeah, I think Machiavelli, he always talks, you find ambizione and avarizia, ambition and greed, you, you find it everywhere. So, so I think he clearly, um, this uh, rule here, the, the multitude is wiser and more constant than a prince, the second lowest uh, bullet point. I think that is clearly based on Machiavelli's psychological or anthropological uh, ideas about people. Okay, Professor Bossi. I want to know what you think about the immoral, the, the criticism. Thank you for your paper. I would like to know what you would answer to those who accuse Machiavelli of being immoral. Mm -hmm. Because I find that you, have, you are right about the method, the empirical method, inductive comparative method, and also the practical goal of this science, and also this, um, that the rules sometimes apply for everyone, sometimes for the Peter Paulou, and sometimes, so that's in Aristotle. But the thing, the, the basic difference what would you say if I, I say he is immoral? What would you say? Would you, what would you answer? Okay, I, I would answer, uh, uh, first of all, Machiavelli is not a Machiavellista, so he's not a Machiavel. Um, and um, there are three, in the literature, I think we can find three defense lines of Machiavelli against this reproach. One, he was a patriot. So he, he says, if we have to save La Patria, um, this goal justifies even immoral means. Um, Machiavelli is a realist, so he, he looks at what actually happens uh, in politics, and um, Machiavelli is also a Republican. So he thinks like a stable uh, political order, to especially to create uh, such uh, a stable order. I think he's a fan of what we call law and order. I think all these are good goals. And, and mantenere lo stato in the sense of avoiding uh, a civil war. Uh, for, for him, that is, let's say, an ethically dignified goal. So I personally, um, um, I, I wrote a little text on this. I'm defending Machiavelli even as someone who comes up with the consequentialist ethics of responsibility in the sense of, of Max Weber. He says, to avoid a civil war, <laughs> and that was again a little topic for <laughs> us over lunch, uh, look what happened when Assad um, was, was they tried to rebel against Assad, the, how horrible the Syrian civil war was. Humanitarian intervention, the responsibility to protect, a very good goal. Let's stop, uh, let's stop Gaddafi. Mm, let's depose Saddam Hussein. That is more difficult, right? That was uh, the Americans and the British. Um, but, but you know, what, what happened? I mean, they're still fighting uh, in Libya. The Iraq is still not, not, not stable. So, so mantenere lo stato, to preserve the, the political order uh, of a state. That uh, is such an important goal. It's a morally <laughs> good goal. So, so Machiavelli doesn't say, he, he says clearly, for example, in chapter 15 and chapter 18 of The Prince, he says, uh, mm, 
non partire del buono ma sapere a entrare nel male necessitato he says not uh, we can act immorally whatever just if there is a necessity if we can foresee from history that it would have uh, would destabilize the political order but, oh, sorry. Uh, may i have a follow-up sure, question sure. but uh, there is no appeal to justice or virtue or <coughs> happiness I don't know. I'm asking because I'm an ignorant. No, so no. I would say that's a general trait of, of uh, if we compare modern and ancient political philosophy, you know, oidaimonia, uh, justice as a means to, to reach uh, the good life, a, a just political order. I would say the ancients had more ambitious uh, political goals. I think both Machiavelli and also Thomas Hobbes, uh, you know, Thomas Hobbes, he grew up during the, the Civil War in England, during the War of 30 Years in Europe. For him, he is happy if there is peace, right? He, mantenere lo Stato, they, they have more modest <laughs> political goals, these modern guys. <laughs> If I may add, add something to your answer, I Please. think it's correct. Um, there is a, an interpretation by Gennaro Sasso, which is Machiavelli as a tragic thinker. So uh, basically Gennaro Sasso says Machiavelli is almost Aristotelian, but then if there are uh, uh, particular issues in which you have to give up morality, then you have to, to choose other options. But it was just... Uh, just an addition. No, no, I, I, I think exactly that's, yeah. you know, I think so clearly. If you just read chapter 18 of The Prince, which is a very disputed chapter where he says the prince has to take uh, the fox and the lion um, as an example, but he clearly says, like in chapter 15, the prince has to even learn uh, to act immorally because there are certain situations uh, which make it necessary. We can learn from history that otherwise there will be a civil war. Yeah, 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 he's not so far <laughs> in, in this sense. Um. Okay, we have three more questions. Machiavelli, El, in El Principe, he is uh, often quoting Cesare Borgia and talking about what Cesare Borgia did in Italy. And I always had an impression that uh, because what he see, what he saw in the Italy, uh, what what Cesare Borgia had to do, that that was for him an argument to say what he says, you know, because he saw what what was needed to be done in his country. So yeah, maybe that could be argument for what you're saying. No, and I think you can clearly see this. And Machiavelli he uses like Aristotle this comparative method. If you read chapter 17 of the Prince. There he compares with Florence politics in Pistoia, 30 kilometers west of Florence, to Cesare's Borgia's politics uh, in the Romagna. And there was a civil war going on in Pistoia, and he says, yeah, Florence didn't want to intervene. And, you know, it was a bloodbath. And what did Borgia do in La Romagna? He killed a couple of people, uh, but he, he said like reso fede pace to, to the Romagna. So he used immoral means for a good course. And he says in the end, he says mm, Borgia was much more, I don't remember the term he uses, but he was a much better, much milder politician th th than Florence who, who, who didn't want to, use any immoral means but they had uh, the, the consequences were horrible yeah. 17 of the prince <laughs> i'm interested in the, the the role of polybius as link between machiavelli's and uh, uh, aristotle's uh, mm, mixed constitution could you explore it a little bit more mm, because i'm really interested in topic and uh, yeah just a second I'm afraid what we have here, no, here is an interesting one. Mm -hmm. So, okay, uh, you know, the American, our American colleagues, uh, Pettit, Pocock, they just talk about the Italian Atlantic tradition. So they say, yeah, 
Machiavelli thought doesn't go back farther than, and you know, these are of course guys against who I'm, I'm arguing. Uh, they say doesn't go back farther to Livy, doesn't go back farther. Yeah, they notice Polybius, but I think the connection between Polybius and Aristotle is interesting. And here um, on the, this bullet point, the first one, some scholars argue that Polybius also Cicero, <laughs> we talked about this, uh, depends largely on peripatetic or Aristotelian sources, in particular on Dicarchios of Messina's doctrine of the mixed constitution. So here you find some, some literature if you want to uh, dig in there. Um, Polybius clearly came in contact with Aristotelian writings. That's what Wallbank, one of the great experts, as you know, uh, on Polybius uh, says. But I think all these scholars agree uh, that the exact reception relations are unknown. Um, but you know, it's always, um, I, it's, it's, I think it's very clear that, that Polybius, of course, he's watching Rome, and, and, but he know, I think that he uses the politeia the constitution as a central category of analysis. I mean, that's Greek thought, right? Mm -hmm. Focusing on the politeia. Why is Rome so successful? Because it has the mixed uh, uh, constitution. So just this perspective, uh, looking at Rome through the, 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 the category uh, of the Politeia, I think that also shows how Greek <laughs> uh, Polybius is thinking in his analysis of Rome's success. I don't know whether you want to follow. Okay. Okay. I think we have another question. No, but okay. So can I just ask something concerning uh, the republicanism? Because uh, of course you, you say you claim that Machiavelli is a republican thinker, but I was I came across an interpretation by John McCormick who claims that Machiavelli is an anti-Republican, and basically he has, of course, uh, a normative component in his, both in the prince and uh, in the discourses. But then, uh, he, he apparently, he would be more interested in uh, uh, the power of the people. So in that sense, I, mean, you, I, I, I suppose you don't agree with that, uh, but uh, mm, I thought that it might be interesting to connect this aspect to Aristotle, because in that case, if McCormick were right, if his interpretation were reasonable, then Machiavelli might also draw on the idea of government by the multitude without specific reference to the mixed constitution. But that's just a suggestion. Well, um, I think uh, that, that do you want to say something directly to Elena? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I don't agree. No, no, uh, I don't agree either. But with, I with McCormick, but, but let's talk quickly, and that was the first question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, why is Machiavelli so much in favor of the rule of the multitude? Because he says, okay, we have these six constitutions, three are bad, but then three are good, but the three good ones, they won't last long. If we look at the cycle of the constitutions, so we, we already know that even the three good ones will perish very soon. So he says, we have to make a mix. And I think many historians, like I agree with Momsen, for example, say Machiavelli, uh, misinterprets the Roman Republic. So the, the, the power of the people was not that great. I mean, even in the Roman Republic, the Senate was clearly the most important <laughs> uh, political institution. And, 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 and yeah, you know, Machiavelli, he also says this, this fight uh, between the people and the aristocrats, he, he says that is a very positive thing, right? He, he sees this uh, very positive, but I wouldn't say, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we need all these components, you know, like, uh, you know, the mixed constitution, the vision of uh, separation of power, checks and balances. Uh, yeah. Okay. Other questions? Silvia was. Just I said, okay. Uh, little mark. We have discussed at, uh, uh, at, uh, at uh, lunchtime about uh, these uh, teams, but uh, in my mind, uh, and in my opinion, uh, the most interesting um, one, the most uh, most interesting uh, uh, aspect of uh, Machiavelli's analysis is the role of passions, as uh, uh, you have uh, uh, very well uh, demonstrated. 
And uh, in particular, you uh, quoted in uh, your PowerPoint also other, uh, uh, also the, uh, um, not only Aristotle, but Plato and Thucydides. Thucydides was the first to, uh, to stress the fact that uh, there is to anthropinon, uh, uh, that is a, a human nature which is always the same and, and, and a nature dominated by desire, passions, and so on. And uh, he saw that uh, dynamics in the Pel Peloponnesian wars. And uh, there is a chain you know, <laughs> which uh, from antiquity arrives to, to Machiavelli. Yes, and I would say that is an important component of what we might want to call realistic political thought. You know, for example, Marx, Karl Marx would say, oh, in a new society, we will have a new man. Um, but of course, uh, all we didn't have a capitalist society in the ancient world. And there were still, everyone is, you know, Aristotle even says pleonexia, that is opposed to particular justice. That is, pleonexia is the same like particular injustice. So, so Plato is criticizing pleonexia. It's the reason for war and, and, and of course, yeah, yeah, he translated <laughs> the <laughs> yeah. Right, so thank you so much, Manuel, thank for you. this very thought-provoking <laughs> presentation. <laughs> and uh, I am happy to introduce you the our second and last speaker. Uh, we have first of all, we have to change. Yes, okay. 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 Professor Francisco Lisi uh, is Catedratico Emerito, Professor Emeritus of Greek Philology at the Universidad Carlos III de Madrid. Before teaching as full professor in Madrid, he has worked in the University of Extremadura in Salamanca and here in this university and uh, has also been the director of the Instituto de Estudios Clásicos Lucio Anneo Seneca. He has coordinating various projects of investigations concerning the contribution played by Greek philosophy in the Spanish Renaissance and those on Plato and the relationships between the republics and the public and the laws. Uh, he's also the author of an excellent, excellent translations and commentaries on uh, Plato's laws in uh, Spanish. And, uh, um, okay, are we ready? Yeah. And uh, today he's going to talk about the reception of the Aristotelian politics in Machiavelli, to antipeponthos dikaion and gratefulness. Good. Uh, I'll, I'll deliver my paper in Spanish. Uh, retaking the old custom of the of the Collegium Politicum of several la different languages, <laughs> European languages, in order to avoid the simplification of our complex cultural relationships. I have done. Uh, you have probably over there an uh, English version. You can follow it. I Good. The first thing, I'll skip the long introduction because we have not so much time. And like the Spanish philosopher Gracian <laughs> said, bonum si breve bis bonum. <laughs> 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 okay. I try to demonstrate that the that reciprocity plays a very important role in Aristotelian uh, politics and that this 
retaken by Machiavelli in his uh, as the figure with the figure of gratitude in, uh, in his uh, discourse among us because I would like to uh, underline before we that are two different works in Machiavelli. One is the discourse, well, several, of course, but the discourse are really, I think, more sincere wor work than the, the Prince. The Prince what is written for the Medici's, yeah? ordered by the Pops, and this is the, which would, should have always this in mind. Good, okay. I'm beginning now in to speak in Spanish. Tal como señala Aristóteles en la ética Nicómaco, toda relación humana debe ser voluntaria y libre. Voluntaria y coac uh, puede ser, perdón, voluntaria y libre, <coughs> voluntaria y coaccionada o libre y, e involuntaria. En el primer grupo se encuentra todo tipo de se encuentra todo tipo de relaciones de intercambio lo que hace que la reciprocidad sea la principal relación y el fundamento de toda estructura social. La crítica fundamental que Aristóteles dirige a la teoría política platónica en el segundo libro de la política es haber asimilado la estructura política de la sociedad a la familia. La sociedad está constituida necesariamente por individuos de diferentes características y habilidades. Esto hace que los hombres puedan relacionarse entre sí y configurar una estructura lo suficientemente apropiada como para tener autarquía, es decir, independencia y no solo vivir en libertad, sino vivir bien y alcanzar la felicidad. La diferencia sustancial entre los miembros del género sociedad implica la necesidad íncita a las limitaciones del hombre de establecer relaciones regulares de mutuo beneficio con el resto de los miembros del género, sean estas directas o indirectas. Es evidente que la base, o mejor dicho, el núcleo de este entramado social lo constituyen las relaciones directas. De ahí que la reflexión de esta girita finalice con la afirmación. Es por eso, por cierto, que lo igual recíproco preserva las ciudades, porque este tipo de igualdad debe existir también entre personas libres e iguales. La afirmación aristotélica de la reciprocidad da a la reciprocidad perdón, un lugar central en la teoría política, pues es la que mantiene la cohesión y preserva la ciudad. El tema es tan solo mencionado al pasar en la política aunque el fundamento sobre el que está construida toda la, la teoría política es el fundamento sobre el que está construida toda la teoría política aristotélica. Sus implicaciones llegan más allá al fundamento ético de toda acción política y por eso se desarrolla a fondo en uno de los libros comunes a las dos éticas, el dedicado a la justicia. En el capítulo quinto de ese libro, la cuestión de la reciprocidad o de lo justo recíproco se encuadra dentro de la estructura jerárquica de la sociedad. La característica de la reciprocidad no es la misma en todos los estamentos de la sociedad. La crítica que en ese capítulo Aristóteles dirige a la concepción pit pitagórica establece implícitamente dos tipos de reciprocidad, la que podríamos denominar horizontal, es, la decir, es decir, la que, se dice en, la que se da entre dos individuos que ocupan el mismo lugar social, o para decirlo en los términos, de los términos, eh, perdón, los términos aristotélicos, que tienen la misma timé o dignitas, y la vertical, es decir, la relación que tienen individuos que ocupan diferentes dignidades, o sea, con diferente valor social. Lo propio de la teoría aristotélica, que creo que no ha sido observado muy frecuentemente, de la reciprocidad, es que extiende el concepto a todo el campo de las relaciones sociales, las comunidades de intercambios, a las que se 
refiere al final del pasaje tienen un valor general e incluyen todo tipo de interacción social. Perdón, I am skipping this part. En la política, 1261 a, 30 a 32, Aristóteles refrenda esta posición, pero añadiendo un matiz muy importante. Según este pasaje, el ámbito de la reciprocidad es el estrictamente político, es la base de la igualdad que constituye la, sociedad, la ciudad y sobre la que se construye todo el entramado social. La justicia distributiva que atañe principalmente al, recar al reparto de los cargos en la sociedad, es posterior y una consecuencia de la igualdad recíproca. En resumen, la, estructura, la estructuración jerárquica es la base del orden social, la contracara del aspecto objetivo de la reciprocidad es la existencia de la gratitud recíproca de las partes, que consiste en la firme argamasa sobre la que se construye la sociedad. A este aspecto del problema refiere el Estajirita en una fugaz referencia al Templo de las Gracias en el centro de la ciudad, 1133 a 1 a 5. El agradecimiento por el favor o la ayuda recibida es el fundamento de la ciudad. La gratitud adquiere aquí la categoría de obligación moral que afirma la unidad en la diversidad. La relación de la, ex, de la exterioridad que subyace a la noción de lo justo recíproco tiene un fundamento ético anterior que es un estado del alma cuyo nombre es gratitud. You can find this same problem in Plato with the concept of filia, of filia of the city. Veamos ahora la gratitudine en Machiavelli, the second Machiavelli, there is gratitudine. Aunque en algunas ocasiones se ha sobredimensionado el impacto de la concepción aristotélica por encima de la platónica en la obra del florentino, es indudable que los escritos de Maquiavelo presentan reflexiones que se originan en la obra de Aristóteles. Diferent diferentes trabajos han llamado la atención, so ya la atención sobre la importancia del libro quinto de la política en la metodología aplicada por Maquiavelo. Sin embargo, a mi entender, el punto más importante del pensamiento aristotélico que recoge Maquiavelo es el de la gratitud, un aspecto central en su, en su pensamiento. Tal como espero que haya quedado claro en el análisis de los capítulos de la política y de las éticas dedicados al tema, la gratitud es la expresión subjetiva de lo justo objetivo denominado tu antipeponzos, antipeponzos dicaion. Ambos se insertan, perdón, ambos se insertan en concepciones diferentes de la actividad política. Mientras que para Aristóteles el conflicto en la comunidad debe evitarse en la medida de lo posible a través de la moderación y, por tanto, la política consiste en limar la contradicción básica entre ricos y pobres, para Maquiavelo esta contradicción es un principio motor con una carga positiva como elemento de desarrollo. Ahí tengo... Perdón, aquí... Bueno, ahora yo no sé... Ah. Bueno. Ah, no. Perdón, no, ya está. Pero, pienso que no. no. ¿Quiere el otro documento? No. Sí, quiero el otro documento. Quiero el, el handout. Ah, ah, ya, perdón, perdón, perdón. No, no, el handout. Ya, ya. Sí, sí, ya está. No, no, está bien. No, sí. Y después si salgo de la pantalla también. Ah, bien, perfecto. Muy bien. Entonces, ahí tenemos, bueno, primero el, el texto griego y segundo el texto de Gael, de un trabajo de 2007 sobre la importancia que tiene el conflicto en el pensamiento macabérico. Es importante subrayar también en este contexto que el conflicto es analizado sobre todo en los discorsi, no así en el príncipe, que tiene otra finalidad. Y donde Maquiavelo, Maquiavelli es 
aparece como más republicano. Habría que ver también qué tipo de república es de la que él está hablando. ¿eh? Si no está hablando más bien de la república de senadores, romana, más que de lo que nosotros podríamos considerar como república, es decir, como una democracia donde eh, gobierna la masa, sino en un tipo de gobierno mixto. Digamos. Es precisamente el peligro potencial que significa el poder del populacho el que lleva la moderación a los nobles y poderosos. Ese peligro potencial es el que fomenta el avance y el consenso. Ambos planteamientos permanecen en el horizonte de la teoría política clásica, que ve la finalidad de la política en la estabilidad y la permanencia. Zotzein ten politeian. Esa es una frase que aparece siempre tanto en Aristóteles como en Platón. Eh, ambos, eh, en este sentido, Maquiavelo, contrariamente a lo que generalmente se supone, permanece en el campo del pensamiento político clásico. Sternberger, en 1978, señaló precisamente la conexión entre la noción maquiavel maquiaveliana de prudencia, Klugheit, Fronesis, con la teoría aristotélica. La inteligencia práctica tiene en ambos pensadores una dim dimensión política que es central, pero es tan solo un estado psicológico del príncipe y su proyección política se encuentra en, y su proyección política se encuentra en el ciclo beneficio, gratitud, beneficio recíproco. Perdón, porque yo aquí he pasado. Bueno. No hay nada hay que hacer. Perdón. No. No, ahora aquí, aquí ya, sí, 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 que ya salí de aquí, sí. No, que ese es el problema. Ahí está. Bueno, eh, ahora, ahora del, el, santo, el, el texto en... <risa> el beneficio recibido se encuentra en diferentes ámbitos de las relaciones de poder. En primer lugar está la gratitud entre los miembros de la élite dominante, en especial la del príncipe o rey, aquellos súbditos Súbditos que de, con aquellos súbditos que destacan por su capacidad o por los servicios prestados a su señor. Varios son los ejemplos históricos que presenta Maquiavelo en los discursos. Toma modo de ejemplo el caso de la ingratitud de Fernando de Aragón frente a Gonzalo de Córdoba, el gran capitán. Es de destacar que Maquiavelo denomina a esta ingratitud natural en el sentido de habitual del término, es decir, que los gobernantes por lo general sienten sospechas y envidia hacia el que a su servicio ha logrado grandes éxitos. Maquiavelo cree que el gobernante traiciona más el vínculo de reciprocidad que el pueblo, al que considera menos ingrato, más prudente y más estable de lo que suelen ser los príncipes. El príncipe suele ser presa de sus propias pasiones más frecuentemente que el pueblo, de todas maneras, Maquiavelo admite que el príncipe tiene una mayor capacidad para ordenar y legislar, aunque en los discorsis se inclina claramente por la república como forma de gobierno. La vinculación. La vinculación de la noción de gratitud con el pensamiento aristotélico Eh, tal como aparecen expresado en la política, se hace evidente en la centralidad que tiene la noción en el pensamiento político maquiaveliano. Maquiavelo parece jugar más con la noción aristotélica que con la derivada de pensadores cristianos como Agustín o Tomás de Aquino, aunque la importancia de Aristóteles para este último también está fuera de toda duda. La idea de ser grato a Dios más que una intención está, eh, saboteadora del pensamiento cristiano, como sostiene Lázaro en un trabajo que está citado en la bibliografía del Handout, eh, es un pensamiento claramente griego, tematizado especialmente por Platón. La gratitud maqui maquiaveliana es, como la noción clásica griega, una expresión de una relación de libertad 
en un marco que no deja de ser jerárquico, tal como indica Aristóteles en el libro quinto de la ética a Nicómaco. Por ello, la noción de justicia implícita es una relación entre libres y en cierto sentido iguales. De ahí que la gratitud se dé en tres planos, entre la relación entre ciudadanos, la del, entre el gobierno con sus ciudadanos y en el de la ciudad con el conjunto de la comunidad. Maquiavelo señala dos fines importantes en la sociedad, para la sociedad, ser libre y expandirse, y considera como un error importante el temor excesivo de la República ante el peligro de ser tiranizada justamente por aquellos que en realidad deberían ser sus defensores más, los defensores más importantes de su libertad. En la negación del agradecimiento debido de la ciudad se trasluce el temor excesivo a ser sometida. Texto 3 de The Handout. Aquí, que no voy a leer para no perder más tiempo. Este aspecto también había sido tematizado por Aristóteles en la política y había concluido de manera semejante que se trataba de un error de la democracia, o más bien, de la masa frente a las personalidades de Collante, aunque consideraba que en ciertas ocasiones era conveniente. Maquiavelo, por su parte, anu eh, anuncia justamente, como está en el texto 3, el dequesti, si, eh, dequesti simile accidenti, se nasce, ne nasce nella República, più spesso per cagione intrinseca che estrinseca, dove molte volte è o è se lascia pigliare ad uno cittadino più forte che non è ragionevole, o è si comincia a corrompere una legge, la quale è il nervo e la vita del vivere libero e lascia si trascorrere questo errore, intanto che gli è più e dannoso partito il volere rimediare che lasciarlo seguire. Maquiavelo tiene en común con el planteamiento aristotélico la importancia de la ley. Y continúa, eh, Maquiavelo tiene en común con el planteamiento aristotélico la importancia de la ley que es precisamente la que aconseja expulsar a aquel que descuella sobre el resto de la sociedad. Es interesante notar que Maquiavelo tiene una actitud semejante cuando juzga que en ocasiones las ciudades toman medidas de castigo correctamente, pero que entre estas se mezclan nuestra, muestras de gratitud hacia los que han servido honestamente a su parte. Da como ejemplo, eh, este es el te testimonio número 4, perdón. El testimonio número 4 también que voy a pasar por alto. Y continúa por, con el, eh, este testimonio, lo continúa con el ejemplo de Colatino y Publio y Valerio que se encuentran en el Hanta o texto quinto. Esto ya directamente... en el cual habla que Roma fue ingrata, pero la menos ingrata de todas las ciudades. ¿no? Eh, Avaris eh, co lo continúa entonces con el ejemplo de Camilo y, Pu y Publio vale Valerio, que se encuentra en el Haddao Texto 5. Avaricia y sospecha son para Maquiavelo el origen de la ingratitud. Estos dos vicios están enraizados en la naturaleza del hombre, que es ambiciosa y tendente Es ambiciosa y, ten, y tendente a la sospecha. La gratitud se encuentra en el centro de toda filosofía política de Maquiavelo, al punto que de, dedica 
el capítulo 30 del libro primero de los discursos sobre la primera década de Tito Livio a discurrir sobre el método que deben seguir los gobernantes, príncipe o república, para evitar el vicio de la ingratitud y cuál el militar o el ciudadano para no sufrir el su yugo. Es interesante que en este capítulo Maquiavelo da dos consejos fundamentales que denotan que ve el problema de la ingratitud, sobre todo en los que ejercen el poder. En primer lugar, al príncipe le indica que salga en persona al frente de su ejército para que nadie pueda llevarse la gloria de la victoria y al general, capitano, victorioso, que al regreso abandone inmediatamente el ejército o que adopte una actitud humilde y se ponga en manos del príncipe para que éste no tome represalias. En caso de que a pesar de todo el príncipe muestre ingratitud, que, una ingratitud que corrompa a los principales del ejército y que, haga, y que se haga amar por la tropa para derrocar al príncipe ingrato. En el caso de la república, la ingratitud se evita diluyendo el mando en diversos ciudadanos virtuosos, tal como hacía la república romana, la menos ingrata de todas las naciones. En los escritos históricos de Maquiavelo, la gratitud se desempeña un papel destacado. Es así que el reproche principal que hacen los enviados de los sublevados en Florencia en 1378 al gonfalonero es la ingratitud que había mostrado hacia la plebe, a pesar del honor con que su, no que con su nombramiento le habían hecho. Sin embargo, no menos ingrato fue el partido de los huelfos cuando retomaron el poder de la ciudad con Michele Dilando, al jefe, el jefe de la... Machiavelli extrae... Machiavelli extrae, perdón. Eh, extrae a una consecuencia que muestra la importancia que otorga a la gratitud como fundamento de la política y el elemento necesario para mantener la paz y la concordia. Bueno, ahí tenemos el, el texto... Eh, no, perdón... Fugli, por tanto, a las sus buenas operaciones, la su patria poco grata, del cual es error, porque molte volte i principi de la República Cagiano no ne nasce per que gli uomini sbigottiti da simili esempi, prima che possano sentire la ingratitudine dei principi, loro li offendono. Tal come succede. En la teoría política clásica, especialmente en Platón y en Aristóteles, dos son las pulsiones que impelen los conflictos en el interior de la sociedad. La de los grandes a ejercer el poder de manera indiscriminada y la del pueblo llano a defender su libertad. Poder y libertad se concentran en, en el caso de Platón en la contradicción monarquía-democracia con la aristocracia con sistema sub, como sistema superior y en Aristóteles en la oposición entre ricos y pobres, lo que es igual oligarquía y democracia. En ambos pensadores la tiranía representa una especie de generación extrema de la democracia. Maquiavelo, por su parte, comparte esta visión básica, pero añade un detalle de importancia que no está presente en los pensadores griegos. La tiranía que se apoya en la amistad con el pueblo, es decir, donde existe una ligación recíproca de la gratitud entre el gobernante y los gobernados. Quelli tiranni que hanno amico l'universale e nemici e nemici grandi sono più sicuri per essere dalla la loro violenza sostenuta da maggiore, maggiori forze che quella di coloro che hanno per inimico il popolo e amica la nobilità, perché con quello favore bastano a conservarsi le forze intrinseche. No obstante, la fedelità del pueblo non sempre è stabile. No siempre es estable y no es precisamente la gratitud lo que lo caracteriza, como muestran las palabras de Messer Giorgio Scalet que dirige al pueblo llano que cuando se ve criticándole su ingratitud después de que él lo había beneficiado tanto. Aunque los ejemplos históricos, esto es en historia eh, fiorentina, aunque los ejemplos históricos de la ingratitud de la multitud no son escasos, en general es más constante que el príncipe, tal como declara el capítulo 58 del libro 
de los discorsi, del primer libro de discorsi. La ley tiene un papel fundamental en el esquema maquiaveliano para, encontrar, para controlar los demanes que de la masa, que, perdón, a los que naturalmente tienden el individuo llano, la masa y el príncipe. Esto aquí. Eh, la ley, bueno, ese es el texto 9 del handout. Eh, aunque los ejemplos históricos de la ingratitud de la multitud no son escasos bueno, la ley tiene un papel fundamental, fundamental gratitud y prudencia recíproca entre el pueblo y su príncipe ordenados y limitados dan estabilidad y permanencia a las instituciones políticas el papel fundamental lo desempeña en esa relación la ley esta debe garantizar ante todo la unidad de la comunidad la unidad de la comunidad evitando la división. Un fuerte elemento es la amistad entre las partes, entre ricos y pobres, a través del beneficio y la gratitud mutua. El tema de la gratitud está presente de manera implícita en el príncipe, donde insiste en múltiples ocasiones sobre, en las virtudes que debe detentar un príncipe, en especial la prudencia y liberalidad. El Subraya que el príncipe no debe apropiarse de lo ajeno, sino que debe tener una vida recta y fomentar la armoniosa actividad de sus súbditos que han de generar la prosperidad. Como ya ha sido señalado por otros, Maquiavelo no restringe... Perdón, no puedo estar ahora. Eh, como Maquiavelo no restringe la gratitud al ámbito político, sino que también desempeña un papel fundamental en la ética, puesto que es el punto central de la acción humana. En algunos testimonios conservados puede observarse la importancia que, eh, que eh, otorgaba a la gratitud de sus propias acciones. Me limitaré a citar las palabras de, que pone en boca del héroe de, de su héroe, Castrucho Castracani, Aquí está. Eh, da Luca en el momento de su muerte y son dirigidas al hijo del que lo había recogido y abierto la puerta al poder. Es porque he venido a morte y e comisi a la mia fe de te y e tutte le fortune sue, yo te con quel amor nutrito de ese con quel la fe de acresute que yo era tenuto e sono. Es porque no solamente fusi tu quello que da tu padre ti era stato lasciato, ma quello ancora, que la fortuna e la virtù mia si guadagnava, non ho mai voluto prendere donna a ciò che l'amor dei figlioli non mi avesse a impedire che in alcuna parte non mostrassi verso il san del sangue di tuo pa padre quella gratitudine che mi pareva essere venuto, tenuto di mostrare. Importante è es che anche nelle carte si conservano molti esempi personales de, Mar de Maquiavelo insistiendo en la gratitud bueno, conclusión como ha puesto de relieve Georgini en, en un trabajo de 2014 que está en la bibliografía es increíble que aún se hoy se siga presentando a Maquiavelo como un defensor de la teoría de que el fin justifica los medios contrariamente el pensador florentino era un claro defensor del gobierno virtuoso y recto, así como de la unión entre política y moral, tan cara al pensamiento político clásico y en especial a Aristóteles. En una reseña, reciente ponencia, he tratado de aparentemente sin éxito defender que Maquiavelo, lejos de ser un representante de un humanismo, de, perdón, lejos de ser el iniciador de la modernidad en el pensamiento político, fue más bien un representante de un humanismo que volvió su mirada a la época clásica. Francesco de Sanctis, en pleno furor del Risorgimento, en 1869, creyó descubrir en el florentino una auténtica revolución teórica y el surgimiento de la política práctica. Un auténtico sueño nacionalista que Maquiavelo
un auténtico sueño nacionalista al que eh, Maquiavelo perdón que yo aquí me he puesto confusiones <risa> Un auténtico sueño nacionalista, y he perdido la página 12. <risa> bueno, la termino, en, la finisco en inglés. <risa> aquí, aquí, un auténtico sueño nacionalista que se ha impuesto hasta nuestros días y agudizado por la crítica católica que vio en él el introductor del mal de la modernidad. Contrariamente, tal como ha puesto de manifiesto Knoll en su exposición anterior, y espero haber logrado algo similar en la mía, la política descrita en la obra de Maquiaveliana es deudora del pensamiento clásico, especialmente el platónico y el aristotélico. Eso es evidente en su interpretación de la gratitud, que es el aspecto subjetivo de la objetividad de lo justo recíproco aristotélico. Para ambos autores, la reciprocidad en las acciones políticas es el centro de la política y para ello, para eso son necesarios pueblos y gobernantes virtuosos que pongan la virtud en el centro de su vida personal y comunitaria respetando la ley. Thank you very much, I Professor hope you have understood that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was a very interesting and stimulating uh, paper. Uh, any question or comments? <laughs> May I? Okay. 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 Um, no, no, uh, uh, she said that uh, you answered the, the question ah, she asked so before. <laughs> she wanted, I wanted, yeah, yeah, yeah. excuse me, I, <laughs> I have okay. a, a deaf <laughs> sentence, <laughs> English author says. <laughs> if you don't have questions, can I just uh, ask you uh, a few things, uh, or if there are other people who want to ask questions first? No, okay. Ah, okay, Bernard, Bernard. Um, thank you, Professor Lisi. Um, I uh, wonder, uh, in this uh, quarrel bef between the ancients and the moderns that uh, ah. is stressed by Leo Strauss, for instance, and many others, um, where is, um, I understand Machiavelli uh, still uh, recovers the ancient thought. Uh, what about Hobbes? Um, and this movement uh, between the summum bonum uh, and yeah. the summum malum, um, which I think is a key uh, element to understand this transition. Uh, so maybe you can say some words about that. Um, thank you. Okay, perhaps uh, we could say that uh, Hobbes is the end of um, evolution begun in the 16th, 16th, 17th century, okay, about modernity, because the, he is, depends, also my knowledge of Hobbes is not so deep, but so far as I know Hobbes, I think he is trying to make a criticism of the classical thought and taking more or less a position that is more in the sense of uh, Yes, Protagorean sophistic thought in the classical world. But that is not the case in, in the f uh, Machiavelli, for, for instance. For instance, the, okay, see, I, I don't know if that's enough, or should I continue? Okay. okay. No, I, okay. I try to, yes. yeah. De la imagen que tenemos de Maquiavelo a partir de la crítica católica, de Rebaña de Neira, de todos estos, y del yeah. nacionalismo italiano. Pero yo diría que incluso más influyente antes es, es la crítica francesa. Eh, en esa recepción en Francia, eh, por ejemplo, Gentillet, que es el que hace el anti-Maquiavelo y demás, ya en sí, su sí. momento trabajaron ya en los 60 y últimamente Fournel, Zancarini, lo han vuelto a, a trabajar bastante. Yo hice no. mi tesis doctoral sobre Gentillet. Yeah. Y, y él es. Eh, eh, para mí marca la recepción como el inmoral antes claro, de la Claro, por eso, exacto. Sí, yeah. 
Pero es sí. muy interesante también porque las dos visiones, la de, la de Maquiavelo como heredero de la tradición clásica, también viene, los estudios franceses son los primeros. La gente que está traduciendo Polibio es la gente que también traduce a Maquiavelo en Francia por primera vez y los ponen ya a dialogar. Es muy, muy interesante esa... Esa sí, bueno, hay toda una política sobre... Que eh, todavía de ahí. Hay toda una discusión sobre hasta qué punto Maquiavelo... Bueno, hay varias discusiones. Una es... How, bueno, hasta que... Prosigo en castellano. ¿Hasta qué punto Maquiavelo conocía el griego? Yo creo que es muy probable que lo haya conocido. Me parecería un poco raro que un secretario eh, de la señoría no supiera... O que el secretario, mejor dicho, no supiera griego. Que no supiera que no dominara las lenguas clásicas. Eso o latín y, mejor dicho, latín y griego. Segundo, es el Polibio mismo, el texto de Polibio y la traducción de Polibio, que aparentemente, o sea, la traducción, la primera que tenemos muy posterior a, a Maquiavelo, pero hay toda una discusión que parecería, no recuerdo ahora el nombre del, del autor del trabajo, que Maquiavelo leyó una traducción al latín, de que se ha perdido. No sé hasta qué punto eso es necesario, ¿no es cierto? Que no haya, por, por ejemplo, él vivía en Florencia, vivía, eh, tenía acceso a muchas obras eh, clásicas, probablemente también de la misma eh, biblioteca laurenciana, donde podría haber consultado a, Pol a Polibio. Eh, así que no, eh, en ese punto no puedo pronunciarme, no he llegado... Creo que todavía nadie lo ha logrado, pero hay gente que defiende que era Polibio, conocía a Polibio. Segundo, que no sabía griego, pero conocía esa traducción que se ha perdido. Y tercero, que bueno, que no, que no hay, que, que sí lo conocía y que o bien a través de la traducción o a través del. Eh, sí, hay una cosa que es muy interesante, que es el tema de la Ana. Bueno, no me quiero extender demasiado, porque al final uno se... Pero eh, es el problema de la anacuclosis. La anacuclosis es un tema muy poliviano. Y también, en cierta medida, también es un tema muy eh, platónico, en el sentido del mito del político, etcétera, etcétera. Aunque él no usa ese término. Y, es decir, ese término está claramente en polivio, nada más. Entonces, eh, bueno... La, tiene, tiene pasajes donde habla justamente, bueno, no habla, no, tam, Maquiavelli tampoco utiliza ese término, pero bueno, está muy cerca de eso la descripción que hace de los ciclos eh, que hay históricos, etc. Ya. Ya, mi español no es bueno suficiente. Ya, la anacuclosis. Uh, discourses, book one, chapter two. Yeah. Uh, I, I did some comparison yeah. between what Machiavelli Same. writes and what Polybius yeah. writes, and he 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 has he he inserts some of his terms like ambizione yeah. suddenly yeah, pops yeah, that, up, that but it's more or less, as I said before, what we would call plagiarism. On the other hand. Uh, what always astonishes me that Machiavelli, first of all, he claims to be such an empiricist, right? He, he observes and he knows Aristotle's p book five of the politics so yeah. well. Okay. And, and in the end of, of book five of the politics, uh, Aristotle criticizes Plato's, I would call it like a very rigid Yeah. scheme like you know the 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 calipolis ah, first sí, it it becomes democracy eight, then yeah. it becomes oligarchy then it becomes yeah. democracy and in the end tyrannous so so i think aristotle has so strong arguments in the last against plato yes, in the course. last chapter of, of of book five how can he at such an important <laughs> point you know the first book chapter two how can he one to one more or less Uh, uh, quote Polybius, so I, I, I don't understand. Ah, uh, yeah, you said he di didn't know Polybius. No, I think he, he should, it seems ah. so clear that ah, he yeah. knew book five of the politics. Yeah. Um, and book five, of the last chapter of book five is such a strong criticism of, of this, course. any idea of an anarchiclosis. And, yeah, and, yes, and so course. how could he still so uncritically 
uh, yeah, take they up take, what, they what, take what Libya's it. right. So for me, I don't have an answer for this, but I'm just uh, yeah, yeah. Su so surprised about this. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, no, no, I, I'm thinking about it. Probably he knew also a neoplatonic text about different uh, historical facets. But I think Aristotle, what says Aristotle is right, but I, I am not sure if this is the historical conception of Plato, because Aristotle is taking historically a book or a, a text that probably for Plato was much more uh, pheno for, yeah, uh, phenomenological. That is a derivation of, from the best state to the worst one. Uh, I don't think there was uh, good. I, that is, uh, this is what I mean. And I, but I am not sure that Machiavelli what meant also that. But one thing is out of doubt. I think that is. Uh, that um, he retakes just what you say, but, but he, no, this is more Polybian than Platonic, because you have also the third book of the laws. And the third book of the laws, the evolution is much more complex. Uh, not, no, this is w only one line, but it's not necessary. What this is much more in the sense of Aristotle's book one, as if you say, would say, uh, that is uh, the beginning of the city, that took, uh, and you, you would took that as uh, historically. I, I don't know. I think uh, the, idea, the Aristotelian criticism is right in the sense that this is evolution of the historical process is much more complex than that. But, but probably is not right in the sense that Plato didn't mean that. Yeah, that's that is the point. clearly a defense of Plato. Yeah, yeah, yeah yes. Plato didn't intend to give a historical... So, uh, yeah, more or less what they think of the, for instance, I think that Aristotle in the criticism of the idea of unity of the city is completely right. <laughs> completely right. Uh, yeah. Professor Kurnis? Thank you so much, Professor Lisi. Uh, just a, a little remark and then uh, a question. Um, the problem of Machiavelli and knowledge of Greek, uh, very, pr very problematic, effectively. Okay. But if you, uh, as you in, in part suggest, uh, um, we have to observe that uh, in Florence, starting from the first half of the 14th century, uh, there, were, there was the physical presence yeah. of many Greek scholars. Yes. So yeah. it was not necessary to know directly yeah. the language uh, ah, in order oh. to assist to classes during which Greek scholars, uh, speaking in Latin, explained Greek uh, classical, yeah. Greek okay. sources. Yeah. So, mm, for example, in the case of Machiavelli, it is certain that he attended uh, the meetings uh, at uh, Orti Oricellari, yeah, uh, yes. when uh, mm, the, 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 the main uh, subject of discussion was classical culture. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, even if he didn't know directly Greek, uh, as uh, far as to be able to read uh, directly ancient sources, uh, Undoubtedly, he n knew uh, the content uh, uh, yeah. of uh, the, the great uh, yeah. historiographical work. And my question is, uh, uh, since uh, one of the topic of our conference is the uh, structure and the recipient uh, of the Book of Political Science, what do you think about uh, the general uh, literary frame of the discourse sopra la prima decca di Tito Livio? I mean, uh, with the aim to speak uh, about uh, politics, uh, the literary genre chosen is an historiographical commentary. Good. This is another, another hint, I would say, to the influence of the Greek scholars. <laughs> because they were very interesting, and the Greek scholars and Greek historians 
about all, all the people uh, around Pletho, Vesarion, and all those people. And I think Machiavelli is trying to uh, rescue the Roman tradition, the real Roman, what he would consider the real Roman tradition, because he considers also, as he said explicitly, I think, in, in the discourse, that Byzantium wa was a kind of treason against the spirit of Rome. He is also uh, polemizing continuously against the, the Greek in this sense, in order to say, no, our history is much more important than the Greek history. In our empire or our uh, institutions are more stable than that. This is more or less the acti attitude of Cicero in this, uh, in this uh, field, and uh, in other fields with, with other, in, always in a kind of uh, friendly controversy with the Greek people, with the Greek uh, culture, culture. Yeah. Just a follow up uh, on this, Michele, but I'm not so sure whether he just wants to do a historical commentary, you know, I think these discourses, I think that's a bit more... Okay, oh, so then I, sorry, <laughs> then it was my misunderstanding, because I think I, in German we, we translate with Erörterungen uh, on, on yeah, yeah. TV, which is more than just a commentary. I, sorry if I misunderstood, no, 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 no. but... I've the starting point is an historiographical commentary, but the final <laughs> outcome is uh, something quite different. Yeah, because he's also taking history as magistra vita in a, a Ciceronian sense. Uh, because, and also because I think uh, first uh, Machiavelli is an historian. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay. Do I have time to ask? <laughs> okay. uh, no, no, so much. <laughs> not so much, <laughs> just one second. Because uh, I we would like to, to ask you to, yeah. to um, help clarifying some questions yeah, yeah. concerning Antipeponsos in Aristotle yeah. and the relationship with, with gratitude. So uh, gratitude is a uh, uh, sort of recognition of benefits, but also of the reciprocity. Yes. So on the one hand, we have Antipeponsos as a state of things. So the city yeah, is gratitude. Objective. Yeah, objective. Yeah. Yeah. Then we have an aware antipeponsos which is recognition of a sort of interdependence perhaps yeah. and then we have gratitude which is recognition of antipeponsos okay yeah. right um, and you talked about aristotle in terms of uh, horizontal uh, yeah, to, uh, all, yeah. all, all implicitly, all implicitly yes. okay, okay so because i was thinking of another way of showing gratitude and arguing through gratitude uh, socrates in the crito is using an argument uh, called the, the gratitude yeah. argument to show yeah. that he has to be grateful towards to the, laws. to the laws. But then in Machiavelli you have the opposite because it's a top down. There is gratitude from the prince or the institutions or ingratitude towards the people. Yeah, well, good. This is one aspect. But one aspect. also you have also ethical. I think I wanted to show that uh, this anti-peponthos, the, the uh, reciprocity, is a general category okay. of classical mm -hmm. political uh, theory, not only Aristotelian. And Aristotle also, when, when he speaks about the temple of Harris, is also, uh, Harris is very important in order to preserve mm -hmm. the unity of the police, because the stasis is the contrary. It's the no recognition of what you, of your debt, against the city or against the other party. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we are uh, coming to, <laughs> to the end. So uh, thanks very much to the organizer, yes. to Professor Kurnis, uh, yeah. and to all the speakers Thank and uh, to all the, the audience <laughs> and all of you for your uh, uh, wonderful comments and, uh, and remarks and questions. So uh, can I ask Michele to say no, something? Or just I think that uh, after this uh, passionate and exciting <laughs> session, we have a uh, 15 minutes uh, break okay. and at, at 6 if you if you agree you can start our general assembly of collegio politico yes of course you. Well, thank you